What does boxing, snuff, Mozart, and Black Eyes have in common? Find out in my latest recap of Bridgerton. Hello everyone, this is D, the man, fellow cinephile, popcorn and emerging film critic, coming to you with reliable recaps, reviews, and reactions. So today I'm coming to you all with another episode of Bridgerton, season one, episode two, shock and delight. This episode was directed by Tom Verica. So I've said this before, but something I love about doing these videos is the research I do and it helps me learn more about actors, directors, and many other people in the industry who I might not have been familiar with. So in this case, many of you would know Tom Verica as Sam Keating on How to Get Away with Murder. But what I did not know is that he has been directing for 17 years. He's directed for shows like Grey's Anatomy, Private Practice, Ugly Betty, which is one of my all-time favorite shows, The Mentalist, Scandal, The Umbrella Academy, and now Bridgerton. And of course, I absolutely wouldn't have known that if it weren't for this, but I was very happy to hear that, and I'm glad to see him directing another great project. And now, let us commence. So we open up this episode with a flashback sequence. A woman is having a baby and she's having a very difficult time giving birth. Her husband is outside waiting for the delivery of his first child and we see none other than Lady Danbury. And she just wants to check in with the young woman and make sure she's okay. But he stops her from going in and tells her that it's no place for a woman. So she's a woman and she's giving birth and the midwife is a woman and she's helping her. And all the maids who are helping her and nurses and everyone are women, but it's no place for a woman. I'm not seeing the logic there. The husband gets tired of waiting, he storms into the room, and shocker, he could care less about how his wife is doing, but he is ready to see his heir, he is waiting for his son. She manages to give birth and success, it is indeed a boy. And so he immediately grabs the child and he's out in the hallway showing it off to his friends and I'm just like, and can the baby breathe before you shove it into these people's faces, but... Lady Danbury goes and checks on the young woman whose name is Sarah. Sarah is just happy she was able to give her husband a son. Unfortunately, doing that took more of a toll on her than she had expected, and she sadly passes away with Lady Danbury by her side. And as she passes away, we hear her husband name his heir. Simon Arthur Henry Fitzranoff Bassett, the next Duke of Hastings. And then in the present day, we see Simon, who is now, of course, the current Duke of Hastings, and he is standing in the very same room in which he was born. And we realize this is the story behind his birth. Then we hit our title credit, and picking up from the last episode, Lady Whistledown makes known to everyone that Daphne's fortunes have much improved since she joined forces with the Duke. She even says that Daphne has emerged phoenix-like from the ashes of irrelevance. <laughs> I was like, what a line. Then we jump over to the promenade where we see the Viscountess and Lady Danbury and they're basically congratulating themselves for what they perceive as having brought Daphne and the Duke together. And then just a few feet away, Daphne and the Duke are hammering out the specifics of their arrangement. She wants to attend eight balls, but he's not really up for that because his whole goal is to keep the mothers at bay, not throw himself into the lion's den. Daphne lets him know, look, my goal is to marry during my very first season. So he concedes and he says, okay, we can do four balls. She says six, he says five. She says six and you can send me some flowers. <laughs> the Duke says, if I really wanted to court you, I wouldn't need to send you flowers. I would just need five minutes with you in a drawing room. Well, Daphne doesn't understand what that means and he quickly apologizes. So we can see, of course, there's a little undercurrent of something between the two of them, but we'll just have to see how that goes down the road. Elsewhere at the Featherington estate, Philippa, Prudence, and Penelope are all discussing Marina's most recent development, namely the pregnancy. Unfortunately, the only plan of action for her is to keep her away lest the daughters catch her condition. If only it were that easy. We also see Penelope and Eloise, who are really good friends, having a discussion as they walk through the city. Eloise is very much a modern woman. She's a woman who's ahead of her time, and she does not find Daphne's ability to attract a man an accomplishment. To her, a real accomplishment is going to the university and gaining knowledge. However, because she is a woman, that is not possible. Penelope lets Eloise know that someone near her may be pregnant. Eloise is like, well, is this your mother? I mean, I know she's up there in age, but <laughs> Penelope is like, uh, no, it's one of the maids, but she's not married. Eloise says, how does she get pregnant if she's not married? Which already speaks volumes about what women were taught about sex and reproduction, which of course was nothing. <laughs> Just going in completely blind. At the Bridgerton home, everyone is relaxing in the drawing room. Eloise decides this is the best time to inquire about where babies come from in front of everybody. She says, ah, I thought you had to be married, but it turns out that's not true. And the Viscount is like, 
<laughs> end of that conversation. <laughs> While they're there, Daphne receives a caller. I'm sorry, did I say a caller? I meant to say a multitude of callers. There is literally a line pouring out of the house. Anthony pulls up with Lord Burbrook and both of them are very confused as to what's going on. Well, naturally, these men have caught wind of the Duke's interest in Daphne, which has raised her stock quite a bit. They run upstairs and we see Daphne in the drawing room with all kinds of suitors, flowers everywhere. So initially, Lord Burbrook was the only man that Anthony had considered because, of course, he was the only man that had proposed marriage. But now he has to reconsider things. So for now, he shoes Lord Burbrook away and tells him we'll talk later. Now, in Anthony's eyes, Daphne is already engaged to be married, but Daphne says, I don't recall anyone officially proposing to me, which is true. Anthony tells her to not be disrespectful, and she's like, I could not imagine a greater form of disrespect than you promising my hand in marriage to that man. And this is the first that the Viscountess has heard about this, so she also is very mortified. Like, you really promised your sister to that man? The Viscountess also mentions that the Duke seems to be very interested in Daphne. Well, Anthony already knows that's BS, so he tells Daphne, you are marrying Lord Burbrook. I'm drawing up the contract. That's the end of it. But the Viscountess tells her not to worry. She's sure that the Duke will put his best foot forward and propose eventually. And Daphne's a little worried because, of course, her mother doesn't know that this is fake. So she says, well, if not the Duke, there's always other men. Her mom says, no, it's only the Duke. Uh-oh. <laughs> We then see the Duke and a good friend of his named Will sparring in a boxing ring. Looks kind of brutal, but they are discussing the most recent developments with Daphne. Anthony suddenly rushes in and he jumps into the ring so he can have a conversation slash fight <laughs> with the Duke about this whole Daphne situation. For Anthony, it just comes down to three things. That's my sister, she's already engaged, and that's my sister. <laughs> The Duke says that Lord Burbrook is an entirely unworthy suitor for Daphne. And this is where Anthony gets a little out of pocket. Say what you want about Lord Burbrook, but you won't find him in the brothels or in any of these other places that you like to sling it. You might be my friend, but this is family. And family comes before everything. We then get another flashback into the Duke's childhood. He's four years old and his father is extremely angry because he should know how to speak by now, but he can't. The tutor tells him that Simon is more advanced with his letters than any of the other children that she teaches. But the Duke doesn't care about that. He wants his son to speak. He tries prompting him to do so. He's yelling at him. He's about to hit him. And then all of a sudden, Simon says no. And the Duke pauses. And Simon is attempting to speak, but we can see that he is stuttering. He has a speech impediment. And he doesn't know how to fully form the words. Well, that's all the Duke needs to see. He knows now that his son is an imbecile and an idiot. And that is not going to work because his family line, which has been declared by the monarchy itself, that cannot continue with a half-wit as his heir. So he then declares that his son, his own flesh and blood, mind you, that he is now dead to him. I understand we're learning about the Duke's background, but like, this is, this is tough to watch. Later, we see Penelope and Marina having a conversation, and Penelope finally works up the nerve to ask Marina how her pregnancy happened. Initially, Marina says, cake. Penelope was looking at the cake like, uh... <laughs> But then Marina tells her the actual story. When she was in Somerset, she fell for a boy named George. They fell in love and they began a relationship. However, George is now in Spain fighting in a war. And he continues to communicate with Marina through letters. And Marina ends the conversation by saying that love caused her condition. Which is true, but there's a whole lot more to that that Penelope has yet to understand. We also find out that the Queen has invited the Viscountess Bridgerton to a private tea in two days' time. We then see the Duke escorting Lady Danbury to another event before we get another flashback in which Simon is visited by Lady Danbury when he's a child. And she's there to make sure he's still alive because his father never speaks of him. She also mentions that he looks just like his mother. She acknowledges that he knows how to read, how to write, to ride horses, and how to fence. But she doesn't understand why he isn't in school. He tells her, I can't speak. And she stares at him for a moment and she shares with him that there was a time where she was afraid of her own reflection and when it came to events she would just shrink off into the shadows. But she knew that one day she would have to step into the light and it wouldn't do her any good to be frightened or timid. And she's telling him how she invented herself and how she became someone who knew how to play the game. Acknowledging the limitations of her position as a woman, yes, but still finding ways to surpass that and become a truly indomitable woman. 
And when she said all this, it reminded me of Dangerous Liaisons. Glenn Close portrays a character named the Marquise de Montoy. And there is a point in that film where she is also describing how she came out into society and how she slowly over time learned and how she was able to use her knowledge to gain confidence and gain power even over other men. So I thought it was interesting that I found some similarities there. And so she tells the Duke, you can speak. I understood you well enough and I will help you overcome all these problems that you're having. But you have to promise me that when it's time for you to step into the light, you will be worthy of the attention that you command. I was like, hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And then they leave together. And then we jump back into the present where the Duke is escorting Lady Danbury into this ball. And I love that whole sequence because it reminds me of the term, it takes a village to raise a child. That's something that's so, so necessary. And I was happy to see that Lady Danbury was able to step in and be that for him. So at the ball, Daphne and the Duke are having a conversation and they're gonna have to renegotiate things because the circumstances have changed. When it comes to Lord Burbrook, we have to make everyone believe that you are on the precipice of a proposal so that he'll just go away. And we get another great dance sequence and we can just see that the Duke and Daphne have a really great rapport together. They have really great chemistry. Much to Lord Burbrook's chagrin, he is standing in the corner just scowling at the two of them. And yet again, Anthony is trying to dissuade the Duke's progress with Daphne. And as they're having a conversation, Lord Burbrook makes his way over and he is basically restating his intentions to marry Daphne. And why? Because he's long coveted her beauty, her grace. The Duke says her powerful right hook. <laughs> Lord Burbrook ignores him, keeps pressing the engagement. The Duke keeps taking shots at him. And his main thing, of course, is that he knows what Lord Burbrook attempted with Daphne. Not just that he's not a good match, but you got way out of pocket with her, which is why you got punched. <laughs> And so the Duke is over it. He's like, are you gonna let Anthony know why you actually got bopped in your eye? He says he was careless with the cabinet door. The Duke says, perhaps you were careless with your honor because we both know what you tried to pull the other night. And at first, Anthony doesn't believe that because surely Daphne would have said something to him. Well, would she? And so once it actually sinks in and Anthony has the realization, he lets Lord Burbrook know, you are not to speak to my sister ever again. You so much as look in her direction and you might end up six feet under. And please understand that Daphne, she's not the only Bridgerton who knows how to throw a punch. Be gone. Anthony lets Daphne know that the whole engagement situation with Burbrook is over. And Daphne realizes that the Duke has told Anthony what happened, but Daphne is not happy about that because he took away the opportunity for her to say something about it away. And there's a possibility that he may have just made things a whole lot worse. As the Duke is out walking, taking in the night air, he is approached by Lord Burbrook. For reasons I cannot understand, he is trying to get the Duke to appeal to Anthony and to change his mind so that he and Daphne can be married. The Duke is like, look, dude, let it go. It's over. Lord Burbrook says, you already have the money and the connections. Why can't you let me have this one? The Duke is like, let you have. I believe that's up to Daphne, not to me. Lord Burbrook says, when I'm buying a horse, I do not negotiate with a horse. I'm sorry, are you comparing the woman you claim you want to marry to an animal for sale? <laughs> oh, alrighty then. The Duke keeps trying to walk away, but Lord Burbrook will not leave him alone. Lord Burbrook says, I find it awfully strange you haven't asked for a hand in marriage. Perhaps you've already had her, sexually. And that's when the Duke stops and turns around and I'm thinking, you are out here in the middle of the night running up on this man and talking kind of crazy to someone who has already embarrassed you. Like, is this really what you want to do right now? And talking about the Duke is one thing, but the assumption that Daphne would even allow him to do something like that is offensive. So he tells Lord Burbrook, stop talking. Do not question her honor like that again. And to be honest, you don't even deserve to breathe the same air as her, dude. Goodbye. Once again, turns to leave. But Lord Burbrook, we just, we just gonna keep doing this. He decides to bring up his father and his mother, his whole background, and how the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And the Duke has been cool this whole time. But clearly, you must wanna get stomped out. Bop, 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 bop. Punches him several times. <laughs> and I was just like, oh well. And I'm just thinking, this is the second time someone has had to punch you out. Maybe you should learn something from that. Learn something from this! So then we jump into another flashback and we are still exploring the Duke's origins. Lady Danbury brings Simon to see his father. He's a little bit older now. And to make a long story short, Simon has made progress, but there's still some struggles there. And for his father, it's still not good enough. And once again, he decides to rip him apart, tells him that he's his worst failure, tells him that he's as useless as his mother was, and that like his mother, 
he's going to basically forget he ever existed. Having all of that just heaped on you at such a young age, I, oh, I was getting so heated just watching it. And we see the Duke in the present day sitting in that same room, the study, and he is just reflecting on how these experiences have shaped him and how damaging those experiences have been also. Then we see everyone out at the promenade. Eloise and Penelope have a conversation about the maid, aka Marina. Penelope tells her, love, that's how it happened. Eloise is like, that doesn't make sense. Penelope's like, of course it doesn't make sense. My mother had three children. Do you think that came out of love? <laughs> but Penelope also tells her that the maid may have a happy ending because she can run away to the country and marry the love of her life. And for Eloise, it's like, marriage? Happy ending? That poor maid. <laughs> Good old Eloise, ever the forward thinker. Anthony has a conversation with Daphne and he assures her that had he known about all of this, he never would have put Daphne in that situation. Daphne is very skeptical. She says, oh, you would have believed me? Or did you suddenly see the error of your ways because another man told you about this? Anthony's like, you think that little of me? And for Daphne, it's like, mm, seeing the way you've handled everything thus far, uh, yeah. The Duke and Daphne reconvene and she inquires about these bruises that are on his knuckles. And he just tells her that he injured it in a boxing match. The one person we are tired of seeing, Lord Burbrook, comes rushing through the promenade and towards the Bridgerton family. And he is all lumped up, bruises all over his face, especially his eye. And Daphne immediately sees that and realizes, uh-oh, the Duke has something to do with this. Well, apparently getting beat twice has not dissuaded Lord Burbrook from his quest for marriage because now he has sought a special license to marry Daphne. I'm just like, this man just will not go away. Anthony's like, we already said this isn't happening. So like, what are you doing? And that's when Lord Burbrook reveals his hand. He basically insinuates that Daphne may or may not have been encouraging his attention out on the dark walk. Is that true? No, but unfortunately all it takes is a word, just a hint, a mere suggestion. And Daphne's reputation goes up in flames. So Lord Burbrook has laid down the law. I'm getting married in three days. Can't wait for our families to be united. Bye. Naturally, Anthony is quite heated and he's considering challenging Lord Burbrook to a duel. The Viscountess is against it. It's illegal. It's a horrible thing to participate in. Don't do it. And Daphne says, even if you do that, he can easily say something before you duel and it still has the same effect. So this is basically a lose-lose situation. She either marries Lord Burbrook or the reputation of her and her family are destroyed. Later, the Viscountess has a conversation with Daphne and she's doing her best to encourage her and try to make the best out of a bad situation. Well, at least you'll be married. You'll have a home of your own. You'll have children. But for Daphne, it's like, all oh, those things are gonna be with Lord Burbrook. This is the worst outcome possible. This is not the life that she wanted. And she's always wanted to marry for love because her parents set the example for her. But what hope is there for now in this situation? We also see the Viscountess sitting down to her private tea with the queen. For a moment, we see the queen sniffing something. At first I was like, did they have cocaine back then? But then when I thought about it, I realized it was snuff, which is the smokeless form of tobacco. I really couldn't see the enjoyment of that, especially with it being tobacco, but hey, everybody has their vices. The Viscountess asks about the music that's being played by the pianist and the queen lets her know that it's Mozart. She also tells her that she became acquainted with Mozart when he was just 10 years old. She then declared that he should be one of the finest composers in Europe and that's exactly what happened. So fun fact, I am a huge history buff and a few years ago I read the biography of Marie Antoinette who of course was the last queen of France. And historically, she met Mozart when she was seven and he performed for her family. It was still when she was an archduchess and long before she ever went to France. And it's even rumored that he had a little crush on her. So as soon as I heard the queen say that, that's immediately what my mind went to. And the queen has mentioned Mozart just to say that when she extends her favor to someone, she expects them to make good on it. Ultimately, the queen, in a not so subtle manner, suggests that Daphne and the Duke need to figure things out. Because if not, there could be some serious repercussions for the family. Yikes. And for the Viscountess, a light bulb suddenly goes off and she now has a plan of action. So first she decides to invite Lord Burbrook's mother for a little chat over tea. And it proves to be a very uncomfortable conversation because Lord Burbrook's mother is not the most graceful woman. And she seems to think way too highly of her son. At one point she even says that her son turned down much more handsome debutantes because he prizes accomplishment over beauty. I'm sure you believe that. 
Elsewhere, down in the kitchens, Rose, who is Daphne's personal maid, she's having a conversation with the maid of Lord Burbrook's mother. She initiates the conversation and naturally they begin to gossip about some things that have been going on in their respective households. And the Viscountess is very much aware of this because the help hears everything, which is very, very true. If any of you have seen Downton Abbey, you know. <laughs> that word travels fast, especially amongst the staff, because everybody knows everybody's business. And now that we've had tea, it's time to spill some. So we find out that Lord Burbrook has had an illegitimate child with one of the maids that he did not provide for. He sent both the maid and the child away and abandoned them to poverty. But the problem is, how can we get people to believe this? Well, the Viscountess knows. We're going to do what women do best, talk. Because you know the one thing that travels faster than anything is good gossip. And we see that the news is traveling everywhere and eventually it makes its way to Lady Whistledown. And Lady Whistledown does not hold back. She lets everyone know that Lord Burbrook is a deadbeat daddy and he needs to pay his child support. And we then hear that Lord Burbrook has expediently left town. Wonder why? Now that Anthony has realized what has happened, he lets his mother know that he'll handle things differently in the future. And the Viscountess says, well, thanks, but I'm good. Mama got this. <laughs> Eloise and Daphne have a conversation and it's here where we can see more of the disparity in their individual outlooks on life and why that causes a lot of tension between the two of them. A big part of Eloise's resistance to marriage and children is that their own mother almost died giving birth to Hyacinth just a few months after their father passed away. So that's really not a positive example of this life I'm supposed to want. But for Daphne, she does her best to still have a positive outlook. She says, yes, that was a horrible experience, but out of it came our sister Hyacinth. So yes, there is darkness in this world, but I still do my best to find the light. And I think eventually we'll both find it. Well, this is not what Eloise wanted to hear. She just doesn't agree with Daphne's outlook on life and she feels like life eventually will show her otherwise, which I understand but just two different outlooks. Eloise is more the realist and Daphne is more the dreamer. We see the Duke and Daphne at yet another ball. They have a conversation about Lord Burbrook and Daphne feels like he shouldn't have handled things that way. He's like, well, I don't tolerate bullies, which I understood because when the only parent you've ever known is a bully, it only makes sense. And so she lets him know like, look, this has to succeed. This is my life. You know, it's hanging in the balance. This has to work. So if you don't agree, you should tell me right now and we can be done with this. He says that he'll agree on one condition. If we're gonna make this convincing, you may as well call me by my name, Simon. And as they're dancing, they're in very close proximity to each other. The vibes, the vibes are happening once again. But they agree that Daphne has to find a husband and a husband she shall soon find. Lady Danbury walks over to the Duke and she tells him that he and Daphne make a fine match. But he's really not paying attention because he's in the zone. He's watching Daphne as she's dancing with these other suitors. Their eyes are just lingering on each other. Lady Danbury asks him if something is wrong. He's just like, no, no. He kind of snaps out of it, but we know what's going on. We then get one last flashback and we can tell this one is very recent. Simon is now an adult and his father is on his deathbed. And his father has completely changed his tune. He calls him son, he's happy and proud that he's grown into a great duke, and he's happy that the great Hastings name will continue. How quickly we forget. So Simon is like, let me kick it to you straight. I have come here to make a vow. The only vow I will ever make. I will never marry. I will never sire an heir. And the great Hastings name, it dies with me. The Duke is, is overcome, he's, he's struggling to speak. And for Simon, it's like, hmm, this is a full circle moment. And he's telling his father, speak, speak, why can't you speak? And finally, the Duke dies as Simon begins to smile. Whew, pretty dark. And that's where we close out episode two, shock and delight. This episode was a whole lot, a whole lot of childhood trauma and sadness and it was a lot, but I appreciated it because we were able to learn a whole lot more about the Duke and we are able to understand why he is the way he is. And I'm still very excited to learn about these individual characters and to see how these stories progress. So once again, this is The Movie Man signing off and I'll see you at the movies.